my name is Anthony Chung. I'm the head of market analysis here at Amplify Trading. If you'd like to access our private chat room to exchange trade ideas with professional traders from around the world, then check out Amplify Live by following the link below. Okay, very good morning to you. Hope you're doing well. It is Friday, uh, it's the 20th of November, and I'm going to get you up to speed with some of the kind of top level macro fundamentals in focus this morning. I'm going to focus on a couple of things. Comments out of Steven Mnuchin last night, which bumped US equity futures down uh, late in US session after market. Uh, we're going to talk about the COVID 19 situation in the US, the vaccine updates and maybe a little slice of Brexit as well, just to throw in there, because there's been uh, an update again this morning as those talks intensify. So let's kick it off and, and talk about the charts to start with. And yeah, let's, let's broaden out some of these US equity charts. And I've continued to keep a running kind of dialogue on the chart to make it as easy as possible for us to have these discussions to make sense of what's been going on uh, particularly in the context of the week as a whole. Always nice on a Friday to just put the, the whole pieces of the puzzle together and uh, to look at where we're at and then overlaid with the technical setup of these charts. And these were the comments that came out last night. I'm going to go over and recap what exactly the Treasury Secretary said last night and what the impact of that could be and the details. But for the moment, the market reacted negative when those comments came out. It was after the closing bell. You can see the S&P dipped. And we came back down to uh, the prior day's low, which has held a couple of times. And actually, on the daily pivots today, this is going to be a really crucial area of support should we retest down on the downside. Uh, we're trading, we have bounced back up through the course of the Asia Pacific session, and we're back to pivot. But if we do get a retest today, that 35, 42 and a half will be a very important level for the S&P, uh, not only for the last two sessions, but also it is the S1 on the daily pivots. Any break of that, then the S2 comes in at 21 with 18 being the low that we had uh, this time last week, in fact, on, on the Friday on that double bottom that held uh, on Thursday going to Friday session. So yeah, definitely they would be the key levels on the downside. I'd keep an eye on any recovery here on the upside, I'd probably be looking up at around 74 uh, and a quarter. That would bring in that high that we saw before the, the dip in yesterday's session uh, in the morning when Europe came in. And that was also uh, a good area of resistance back on the 11th going into the 12th uh, before the eventual break higher that came late in Friday session last week. So on the upside, uh, beyond that point, 82.75. So these are the kind of the more key big areas, uh, I think, of technical relevance for the S&P at the moment. So 82 and three quarters on the upside and 42 and a half on, on the downside. Uh, that upper level, you can see then not only the high from uh, the pre Mnuchin comment when we had a little squeeze into the close on Wall Street, very moderate outperformance from the NASDAQ, some of the tech stops, tech stocks, and those stay at home names on a single stock basis outperforming again, just given the, the pickup in COVID and uh, ensuing restrictions we're seeing in North America. Uh, but then that comment obviously bumped things back down again. But you can see here that high with those lows that have held through the week on Tuesday and Wednesday session, uh, as well as that initial then closing high that we had on Friday last week, is quite a key level on the upside. I'd be keeping a close eye on today if we move to the upside. Um, the Dow tells a, a similar kind of story. So just making that a bit bigger, we'll have a quick cycle through some of these charts before we get into the, the headlines. and. Yeah, this is bringing in the, the full kind of story from the, the Pfizer bid, that super aggressive move that we saw in that first um, outline of the details uh, on their stage three trials. We had the Moderna bump to retest to the tick in the doubt up at around that 30,000, of course, on the double top. We've come back a, a fair amount. Uh, and now looking at this Dow chart this morning, the kind of areas uh, that I've marked out that I think will be uh, significant uh, in the interim period, uh, around the pivot, just below it, you've got this area um, of, of, that's been important for price when above and below, uh, which is around the 29 kind of 300 level, uh, the pivot coming in just above there about uh, 320. Uh, on the upside, then you've got that midweek low with the rejection we've had twice in yesterday and the overnight session. And so that's going to be a key area as well on the upside if we, if we push up for a recovery today. 
and, and on the downside, any breach down towards the overnight low, uh, which would be then on the daily pivots, the S1, then you've got that also low that was seen on, on Friday last week before the push up. So uh, 29,137 would be quite quite key there. So that's the kind of range of activity I'd be looking at for any more um, kind of forceful price movement. Um, otherwise, in the other markets, the other one I wanted to have a look at was the US 10 year. And as you can see here, I've, I've just put a few things on here. One is the uh, obviously the, the, the initial knee jerk reaction with the Pfizer information is that, you know, it's kind of the interpretation at the time was this it kind of accelerates then uh, the recovery, the kind of world post coronavirus. Obviously, it's just been decidedly short lived, as this chart kind of suggests, because after that initial yield spike that we had back on the 9th last night, in fact, um, into the close post just over the closing bell on Wall Street, um, T notes were actually trading up, completely taken back that entire move. Um, as the COVID-19 situation obviously worsens, we're a way off from getting any stimulus on Capitol Hill. Uh, and so all of these things uh, are back in play again. And as you saw, you know, Xing out the bounce we've had since uh, Europe has come in, the dollar after, after surging higher uh, around this time yesterday it came all the way back down. Uh, and that coinciding then with yields also declining at that point. And uh, we've come up to uh, a fairly interesting level around 138.19. Uh, I've just put on these trend lines here from the price recovery that we've had. Uh, and this is taking from Friday or well, last Thursday at the low here, price activity. So kind of looking at this at the moment with some interest, um, Mnuchin comment obviously bumped things up and we just ran into resistance. Uh, at around what is the R1 today on the daily pivots with that trend line, um, I, I think will be quite a, a key area of resistance as well to have a look out for. Uh, again, in terms of getting up there, perhaps if we see an equity sell off when it starts to look heavy going into the weekend, the, then if we get any breach above here, uh, looking at the trend line, then you've got the R2 and then that eventual high that would come in up at around the 9th, just prior to the Pfizer news breaking. Uh, that I'd be keeping an eye on. Otherwise, in the gold and oil market, I'm not really going to go into those in detail because uh, not too much in the way of uh, of interest right now as we're speaking. In the currency markets, as I said, the dollar um, dropped considerably during the US session. So we've come back down to test, remember that really super important key level uh, on the higher time frames in the Dixie, which if broken, uh, would be a meaningful kind of trap door potentially for quite extreme and rapid dollar weakness. We have bounced again this morning in Europe. I guess what I'd be quite interested to see is how big are these kind of rejections off that support break um, on that level. And if they start to get continually more shallow, uh, I, I think it could be quite interesting to watch. Even more so when we layer in, as we'll discuss, what Steven Mnuchin has done, which I think for me personally is, is a negative thing for the dollar, which I'll explain in more detail. Um, otherwise, though, for the moment, a bit of a, a dollar bounce, though, for right here, right now, uh, just coming off that uh, more aggressive selling that was seen late into the US session and overnight in Asia. So the pair is just taking a bit of a turn here, cable back to pivot on the Brexit side of things. Um, you will recall yesterday uh, there was a halt to proceedings. They're now moving to virtual meetings, given that one of the European group, uh, they're, they're basically going into quarantine because of COVID-19 case. So the latest this morning is an EU envoy has said the three main Brexit hurdles. So when they say three main hurdles, they're referring to fishing rights, level playing field and state aid. So those three main points remain unresolved and the UK has not moved on these issues. Talks will continue. Uh, that was the latest that's just come out literally a couple of moments ago. So I, I can't see how anyone can find any of this surprising. Uh, as much as they continue to say they're going to strike a deal, I still find it incredibly hard to believe that as soon as today or even Monday, which some press sources have uh, indicated. So keep an eye out for it. It's still ongoing. Obviously, they're in virtual meetings. I would expect probably some more uh, Brexit comments uh, to be coming out, not just today, but also over the weekend as well. 
Um, all right, well, let's get stuck into some of the news. I'm gonna give you a quick recap of the COVID situation, and then uh, I'm gonna run through this whole um, Treasury Secretary commentary from last night. So, starting off with the US, case numbers continue rising. I'll keep this as short uh, as possible. Uh, it has led to some commentary out of the CDC. So the CDC, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in America, uh, someone you hear about uh, on a fairly regular basis in terms of their commentary. Uh, they've urged Americans not to travel on Thanksgiving. And um, we've talked about this a couple of times. This is a really, uh, it's gonna be quite a pivotal moment in terms of the future development of this virus in America, given the fact that ad adherence to social distancing and, and group sizing rules uh, in regards to gathering is going to be absolutely critical. Otherwise, what is already a fairly bad situation could get much worse very quickly over the period of then going into mid-December when we'll start to see uh, any types of emergence of, of renewed cases given the incubation period typically of the virus. So uh, they're already doing that and that's led to a few other things. So I'm uh, just cycling through yesterday's death count if you'll notice here i know it's a bit hard to see because it's gray but on the far right hand side you've had big spikes now in the death rate so this is that catch-up we've been referring to from the laggard effect of the death rates to the the counts that the case acceleration we've been seeing and so in the last two days you've effectively had uh, death rates of n near 2000 which haven't been seen you can see we've got to go back to you know, we're getting from May pushing into April toward the peak now. And so, as you can see, the seven day average is getting ever more steeper. Uh, and as we said before, we're anticipating that that pattern will continue for the time being. Um, it is putting pressure on the infrastructure in, in the US. Um, almost 80,000 patients are hospitalized with COVID-19 in the US at the moment. Uh, another high in a week that has pushed up the record uh, every day since the 10th of this month. So the last 10 days is when we breached the kind of peak of hospitalizations that we saw with the initial tri-state and then some belt outbreaks that we had in the spring and summer. Uh, we're now well and above that uh, at the moment. This is causing further restrictions then and restrictions in very key areas economically. Um, we've had California governor issue a stay at home order banning uh, non-essential work and gatherings from 10 p.m. to 5 AM. Uh, it's going to go in effect on Saturday and will last until December 21st. So a curfew being implemented uh, there in the state of California and then equally so in the New York City, uh, in NYC, the mayor has come out and said it's just a matter of time until the state orders a halt to indoor dining and a shutdown is likely to come in the next uh, week or two. This of course follows the shutting down of the entire New York uh, city school system, which is the largest in the country, of course. So things are, are happening now on that front uh, as the situation continues to, to escalate. Uh, and that economically is going to be interesting because of particularly what's just happened with what the commentary um, that the Treasury Secretary has just said. Um, just to round this off, there's a few other things on the vaccine front to be aware of. Uh, the World Health Organization has come out and recommended against using Gilead Sciences Rendesivir um, to treat hospitalized patients less than a month after it received regulatory approval. They've come out and basically said that there is currently no evidence that it improves survival or the need for ventilation. Again, the Remdesivir therapy was not about a vaccine to cure against immunization against COVID-19. It was about then the ability for people to recover quicker. Uh, this was something I believe that Trump was using at the time, um, but this is qu quite a blow to Gilead. I'd uh, be interested to see how their, their shares uh, perform later on. So after some of the positivity we've had with Pfizer, Moderna, uh, a slight negative here in regards to Gilead Sciences. BioNTech and Moderna could receive though, um, according to latest reports, EU um, marketing authorization for their COVID-19 vaccine in the second half of next month according to the EU's executive arm. Uh, and yeah, the order size is pretty phenomenal for those companies. If that does come to fruition, uh, the block is up to 300 million doses on order, which is pretty mind blowing. Um, let's get into then this chap. This is the kind of outgoing Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, and he's been under pressure from Republicans. 
uh, within the party to kind of wind down some of the Federal Reserve's lending facilities given um, what we have seen, which is on paper a recovery of the US economy. Now, that's not strictly true. We obviously know as market participants because the high frequency data, which is more accurate for the present context of now, given everything I've just discussed with COVID, is getting worse. Activity will slow uh, and we are inevitably going to see this kind of double dip type uh, impact on the economy. And so herein lies a problem, really. And, and this has been a, an evident thing of 2020. And not only is it how would you deal with a virus if there was no politics, uh, you know, would you rely on the science and what decisions then might have been taken by governments? But now political agendas kind of cloud the judgment, uh, I think, to a certain degree. And this can have severe repercussions then for how financial markets might respond. Um, because political parties servicing that agenda are using then the types of narrative, like the GDP number that we had, for instance, that short, saw a record breaking bounce as legitimacy to take certain actions when we know that that's not strictly true because things are actually getting worse right now uh, and are set to get a lot worse going forward over the kind of November, December data set. So basically what's happened here um, is that the Treasury Secretary, this chap, Steve Mnuchin, has made a request for the Fed to return unused um, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act funds and also to shell several programs uh, from the Fed that utilise those funds. Uh, the move then, the, the political kind of uh, strategy here is that it would allow Congress to reappropriate approximately $450 plus dollars out of what's been kind of put aside for these various different programs, chiefly under the umbrella of the Fed, and pivot that back in to then get the ball rolling back with uh, negotiations on Capitol Hill about fiscal stimulus, because ultimately that 450 plus billion dollars, um, you're not actually asking for new money, so to speak, it's just being rotated from one place to another. And so that, that's the, the logic. Uh, the facilities then that Mr. Mnuchin is looking to end, and I've got a graphic here, because there are many different emergency measures that have been deployed by the Federal Reserve beyond that of just uh, the kind of promise of unlimited QE and, and obviously zero bound kind of rates. Uh, there's two schemes set up to purchase corporate debt. Uh, so I just move this out of the way. So there was uh, two schemes set up to purchase corporate debt, five facilities created to lend to medium sized businesses, collectively known as the Main Street Lending Program, and one program led to lend to state and local governments and another to support asset backed securities. So they're all of the ones of which Mnuchin has asked the Fed basically to halt in order to then pivot that cash flow to, to, to another part of the government. Um, the Fed have come out and Considering the type of words that were used, uh, they said they preferred that the full suite of emergency facilities established during the pandemic continue to serve the important role as a backstop for our st still strained and vulnerable economy. But look, reading between the lines here, that's the Fed saying, back off. This is a bad decision uh, and this should not happen. Uh, well, you have to understand that a central bank is never going to be as vocal and explicit as someone like Donald Trump or a member of his administration because they're not in that game. Uh, but that was pretty forceful from the Fed uh, and I think rightly so protecting what has created and fostered a high degree of stability because if you remember what it was like in markets back in March, you know, it was a very precarious situation. Uh, and so yeah, here on lies then a bit of a problem because for me I think that this move um, I can see why it might make sense from a political Republican point of view particularly for uh, Trump outgoing He's really got not too much to lose here and if it makes life more difficult for Biden then so be it uh, but from a markets point of view I actually think this is quite a big deal because markets function in a fairly behavioral way and as you can see here looking at all of these programs put together the treasury backstop and the program limit the usage of which all of these different facilities uh, have been used is marginal 
it's not a great deal. So on one side, that makes sense to, to end it and use that money uh, that could have more immediate effect elsewhere. The problem you have is the whole reason the market stabilized and has recovered Wall Street, not Main Street, in the way that it has, is because of the nature of the bazooka type response that the Federal Reserve have done. And if you start then taking the punch bowl away, when we're just going into an episode of an economic new downturn, um, given the fact of what we've been discussing with the restrictions coming in, in the most economically important areas, and also nationwide, as COVID is not going to show any signs of holding up anymore, with the added risk of Thanksgiving coming in, just to give it another uh, period of acceleration, I think this is the worst possible thing that you could do right now. And I think for political leveraging, for stimulus talks, I think they're playing a risky game here. Uh, and although you can see some of them have hardly been used at all, that is not the point. Uh, it goes all the way back you know, through my time in markets, uh, very reminiscent of the European sovereign crisis when the ECB at the time created different types of facilities that never got used. But the point was that the fact that they existed and they could be used was enough to pivot the market back into a state of confidence and then stabilize the market and see the recovery ensue. So this to me is, is a little bit worrying if this starts to uh, get a little bit more developed as a story. Uh, and certainly if it did come to fruition, I think the markets are not gonna like it. And if it doesn't like it, I think that they, that doesn't see a flight to quality bid in the dollar. I actually think the opposite because I think equities will fall and, and that might put the dollar under pressure because economically this is the worst time possible. And then ultimately, this is going to have to have the Fed step in at some point and just do more um, at that point. So yeah, definitely one to watch, particularly as I say, given the fact that we're at a very important strategic technical level now in the uh, dollar index. And if the dollar breaks down, um, that could be very meaningful for the FX market and a broader sentiment for the, the overall market cross asset. All right, quick look at the, the calendar for today. We've already had the retail sales uh, out of the UK. And quite frankly, I'm not even going to tell you the number because it's insignificant. Yeah, it does not matter. This is backward looking. It's pre latest level of restrictions in the UK. It really is of little importance. Uh, right now. What is important then is how does this type of thing fare when we go into November and December. You've probably already read some of the headlines from overnight. Consumer confidence is very low. Um, company confidence is incredibly low. I think I read that only one, uh, what, one in three companies in the UK that were surveyed um, don't believe that they're even going to survive once the economy reopens. So this isn't really so much about data that's um, looking at, at this time frame. It's about more, again, relying on, on high frequency data points and then thinking about the, the future. Now, don't forget as well that at any point in time, fully expecting the UK to kick the can down the road with the current restrictions, which are due to expire on the 2nd of December, most likely up until Christmas Eve to allow that loosening of restrictions over the Christmas period. And again, scientifically, should they do that? Well, of course not. But the government is very mindful of appeasing public um, opinion. And so at the risk then of um, further negative developments on the COVID side, this is a strategy they're looking to do is to suppress the case down low enough that they can then have that opportunity to give people a, a normal, regular Christmas experience. Um, otherwise, speakers... Lagarde speaks again, um, really hard to see that she's going to say anything that important. She's speaking at Frankfurt European Banking Congress and she's spoken multiple times throughout, throughout the week, so not anticipating anything new. You've got Fed's Kaplan, Barker George, the only one of a voter being Kaplan, speaking at an energy conference at 1.30 this afternoon. But look, that is it. So just as a reminder, I will do my regular... Uh, kind of summary of the news and, and, and a look at the major themes the week ahead. I will tweet that on a Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be in Amplify Live throughout the day today. So I'll see you guys on there. 
And uh, yeah, wish you a great weekend ahead. All right, guys, take care.